This conference will now be recorded. Okay, folks, so we're on uh, Tuesday here before Thanksgiving. Uh, we will not have a lab on Thursday. You know that, you get that. So you'll see here as far as there's Thanksgiving, no class. There's also no quiz this week, okay? So what we're gonna be doing is we're going to be uh, doing the, I have a digestion system quiz. We're not going to have the, re, uh, the respiratory system quiz. That's just not gonna take place this semester. It's okay because I'll have respiratory questions on the final exam, okay? So we have a digestive system quiz uh, next Thursday not this Thursday, next the following, then a urinary system and then reproductive system. So the next few weeks, this is what it's gonna look like. Your final exam will be available on 12-18 Friday to Tuesday, 12-22. So you'll have that period of time to decide when you would like to take the, the final exam. The final exam is open book, open notes, okay? Um, you're not allowed to go Google answers, but you're able to go through your notes and whatever that you have taken uh, throughout the semester that you can review. But know that the final exam, there will be a time limit. So, you know, you'll have a time limit on that. I haven't determined how many questions. It's usually around 100 questions, okay? And the time limit usually is around two hour mark, right? So, uh, so you know, you'll, you have a limited time, but you'll be able to, it is open notes, open book, right? Just can't, like I said, can't Google the answers. So today we're gonna to be going over the urinary system and I'm right now I'm gonna take a moment to look and show you and share with you uh, the final project, the paper. You'll see here above, it says the presentation will be the only paper due, no more mini papers, okay? And so what you can pick from as far as illnesses are concerned will be from the digestive system, actually for the, uh, yeah, the digestive, urinary, and reproductive system. So you can choose from those three systems, some type of uh, pathology, some type of uh, illness, disease, disorder, okay? And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you also to be able to send me your choice so I can try and make sure that we're not all doing the same uh, <laughs> subject matter. Um, you know, they, they, there's a, div a diversity because what you're gonna be doing is sharing this information with us all. You'll see here where it shows you on 1210, 1215, and 1217, those three classes, you're going to be sharing a few minute presentation, just talking a little bit about in GoToMeeting, you're gonna be talking to us all about your uh, paper that you, uh, and the, the subject matter that you chose to talk about, okay? So- It'll be a PowerPoint or essay. No, you know, it's more of just, I want you to just give me a, a couple minute, um, some summary of what it is the top subject matter so it's not going to we're not going to need all three of those days i know that okay but i just set that aside but i just you know because i do a little bit each class period okay but you know just a, a summary of what it is that you you can even have um maybe print out um a sheet or a couple sheets of images um that's fine um i think that i can actually um share the presenter, being a presenter for the for the GoToMeeting, um, but I, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather just have you just talk a little bit about your paper, that's all. It's not gonna be, it's really not any type of crazy thing. Just a few minutes of giving us a summary of what it is. And really, let me, let me, let me minimize this for a moment because I really wanna share with you that the paper, as far as understanding what it is that you'll be required of you. Okay, so here, here is that, that document, okay? It's one page, okay? And what you're gonna see here is that on the bottom, it says here, three page minimum of research information. So that three pages does not include, does not include your citations, okay? And it doesn't include the abstract, okay? That's, that's separate from the documentation, okay? So it's, a, it's an APA paper, okay? And so again, you've all been, you know, trying to follow those guidelines there. You know, you can go to SiteFast, you can go to our, our library page. If you have any questions, send me an email and I'll send you information, okay? Um, but this is the information, the body of the information that you're going to provide for me in this three-page minimal paper, okay? And again, here you'll see um, 12 font size, right? Double-spaced, that's what it, where I want it at, okay? Um, so you can do more than three pages, that's up to you, okay? Um, because you're going to have an introduction, including all, any uh, historical significance of the illness, like tuberculosis. There's some absolute historical significance to that. 
um, but that's that's a respiratory system. So we want digestive, urinary, reproductive. Okay. Um, the demographics: who it is that would could suffer from this? The age, their sex, uh, genetic. Is it genetic or not? Or um, race? Geographic factors: infection. Is it infection? Um, <clears throat> Signs and symptoms. So signs are what the doctor will see. Symptoms are what the patient experiences. So you'll see here, so signs. So the, the, the doctor, the clinician can take your temperature, can see uh, what your pulse rate is, can check your blood pressure, right? This is what, those are signs. So is there high blood pressure associated with it? That's just an example. Symptoms, what the patient is experiencing. Uh, I feel hot flashes or cold flashes, or I feel, um, a lot of pain and discomfort, uh, nausea, dizziness, shaking, you know, these are what the patient is experiencing. Uh, the diagnostic, so what's being used to diagnose this illness? Uh, what type of treatment, medications, um, surgery, surgical intervention, whatever it is that's involved in the treatment. Uh, the prognosis, so is it just a, an acute condition, right, where they just have it and they, they, they get treated and they're, they're cured, or is it a chronic condition? Uh, and so, if so, um, will, you know, might they pass away early as a result of this illness? Will the illness kill them? Uh, prevalence, as far as is it common, is it rare? Um, any type of new uh, information regarding uh, treatment and new research that just came out within the last year or two, that would be helpful. Um, you can use your textbook as a reference. I want to tell you that. So, you need two references. Your textbook can be one if you'd like doesn't have to be, and you can have more than two references. You don't have to have just two. Discuss the life of a patient who's living with the illness, the challenges. Is it easy? Is it difficult? Um, there's YouTube uh, vlogs of people who suffer from specific types of illnesses. Um, you can look up that information on the uh, website that is a uh, website that deals with the illness in particular, like so multiple sclerosis. There's support groups, there's the, a website that's just for a foundation or an organization just dealing with multiple sclerosis and it can talk about what it's like to be a patient living with multiple sclerosis. Understood? So I know it's not nervous system that we're looking at, but I'm just giving you an example. Okay? And then you'll see here as far as how the patient paper is graded. The presentation is just a small part of it. Okay. And the presentation, again, like I said, it's just a few minutes of just discussing your paper. That's all just so that we can all help each other and help each other to learn from your research, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment here and I just ask if there are any questions at all regarding the paper. And again, too, if you have any questions, please don't feel funny about sending me an email. No, it's okay, I'll, I'll answer any questions, all right? Any, anybody at all, Ashley? Um, so on the bottom of that, um, like the rubric that you're showing us right now, it says uh, PowerPoint, but you just told Will that we don't have to create a PowerPoint. Yeah, so, it's... so I have to, I have, that was when we were on campus. So I'm just going to then, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to just remove that. I just, I just, I, for, I just noticed it now that I did not uh, remove that. So I'll remove that and just add, you know, put the points around. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay, yep. sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ashley, for pointing that out. I wasn't even realizing. Yep, thank you. Th and thank you, Will, for making mention. I didn't realize that I had it on the paper there. So, yeah, so don't worry about the PowerPoint, please. Okay? Good, thank you. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to hide everyone. I'm going to finish going through, share my screen, and continue going through the revised semester schedule. So you'll see here as far as uh, reproductive system will be next week. Then I'm on the following on the Thursday. So di the quizzes are always, you know, from like the Thursday to the to the Monday or the whatever, you know, along those lines. You'll have a few days. Um, but we're going to do lab. That will be the last lab next week, next Thursday. I'll go over digestive and urinary systems anatomy. Then we'll do finish up the reproductive system lecture the following week. We'll have our lab quiz for lab quiz three, and you have that document posted in documents and resources. And then uh, we'll do presentations, and then you'll see that from there. And then, like I said, with the final exam, when it'll be due. Okay, let's minimize that. And now I'm going to go to the urinary system as far as uh, our PowerPoint presentation today. Okay, 
So I, I, I'd like to uh, show you, give you a visual aid here. So you'll see here, I have a, a two liter bottle of soda, right? Okay. So imagine that your body will produce, now it's not, it's not going to produce as many of these that I'm gonna tell you right now, as far as urine is concerned, but filtrate. So filtrate is the begin, it would be prior to it becoming urine, it's called the filtrate. So we filter blood to form the filtrate. And now think about this at eight to 10 of these two liter bottles of filtrate are produced every day. Eight to 10 of these two liter bottles, right? So two liters of fluid, eight to 10 of these are produced every day of filtrate. But out of all of that many two liters, right? Full of liquid that's filtrate, only about approximately one of these or one and a half of these two liter bottles is actually the urine that's produced that actually leaves the body, okay? So that just gives you a little bit of an idea as far as how much blood, the blood is continually being filtered, filtrates continually being uh, produced, but it's being reabsorbed back into the body. And again, only about one and a half to two liters of uh, urine is produced per day, you know, approximate, depending upon the patient's conditions and their health, more or less can be produced. So you'll see here that really the urinary system is involved in fluid maintenance and really the uh, the really the regulation of the fluids in the body. So the chemical makeup of body fluid is constantly changing, right? And the urinary system has a big role in this, okay? Um, the adult body weight, approximately 50 to 60% fluid, and the majority of that would be water, okay? So no matter what the fluids are that are flowing in our body and they're part of our body, the, the highest percentage of the fluids that's, that make up that fluid would be water, okay? So extracellular fluid includes the tissue fluids, uh, which cover all the tissues of the body, uh, the plasma, the liquid portion of the blood, the lymph involved in the lymphatic system and uh, immunity, um, other fluids such as cerebral spinal fluid. These are all fluids present within the body. They would comprise the extracellular fluid. So let's look at this. Now this is really kind of hard to see. But what you'll see here is that over here on this side, so from here to here, would be the amount of extracellular fluid within the body. From here to here would be the intracellular fluid. So the whole human body, about approximately 46 quarts of fluid in the human body. And it's broken down into extracellular and intracellular. Extracellular is outside of the cells of the body. Intracellular, inside of the cells of the body. So the extracellular would be the plasma, the tissue fluid, which is called, also called interstitial fluid. And then we have here, as far as small percentage, lymph, cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, mucus, right, and other fluids, very small percentage. These will all be considered extracellular fluid outside of the cells of the body. Interesting chart here and table that you're seeing as far as uh, the gain and loss of water. So there's a normal daily balance between how, how much we actually gain, receive, and how much we actually lose. Okay? You see here that that's a balance. And so homeostasis is the ability to create a stable environment within the body. Well, the urinary system is involved in the homeostasis of the body fluids. So this extracellular fluid, so you'll see here as far as some is absorbed from foods, some is uh, from liquids consumed, right? From drinks and like so here as far as, you know, soda's not great for you, but every once in a while I like that. Um, some produced during metabolic reactions. So as a result of an, a reaction taking place, water is produced, okay? So water deficit induces a thirst mechanism. So if, if we're having a, uh, if we need water, if the body needs water, it will then stimulate uh, a, a thirst mechanism where you'll be like, oh, I'm thirsty, I need to drink. And so uh, there are issues with certain conditions of the body that uh, patients lose that desire. And especially when a patient gets older, just the, as the result of uh, getting older, uh, older age, uh, becoming uh, in that geriatric population, right? Um, they can have issues with that thirst mechanism. And, and and a lot of times also, they just don't want to drink because if they drink, they have to go to the bathroom. And I know that seems like, yeah, right. But, but they also have difficulty. They have pain and discomfort moving around, ambulating, moving around. So they'd rather not move around as much. 
where really the the, prob the the issue is that if they move, it'll help with the pain and discomfort. But you know, if you've been in chronic pain ever in your life or any type of acute pain, and you know, I don't want to be in pain at all. Well, imagine as you get older, there a good percentage of the population have pain throughout the day, and it's terrible stuff. So we can lose water as a result of our urine through the feces, uh, through sweat and evaporation. So urine will release excess water. So if we have too much water within the body, then the, the urine urinary system will process it and will actually excrete it, we would say. EX, let's put that here. Excretion. Okay. And also uh, excess or harmful solutes, like how about too much salt, right? Too much salt. The body will process that and get in, and relieve that. Okay, excrete that. Okay, uh, source of solute, solutes present within the ECF as a result of food, as a result of uh, different respiration that's taking place as far as metabolic reactions within the body, uh, metabolism here. Um, most solutes, right? These would leave by urinary excretion. How about um, if a patient is a diabetic? Would they have uh, would they have excess glucose uh, leaving? The urinary system in the body, absolutely. Okay. Um, here, here, this is interesting. That exhalation, just the process of uh, pulmonary ventilation, right? We're inhaling, we're exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. Well, exhalation, we know this expels CO2. That's a waste. And sweat will rid the body of some of the urea, which is a product of protein metabolism. Primarily, it's going to be released through the urinary system. And this is a good graph to just show you as far as what's taking place with, uh, we're taking in water, we're taking in food, we're taking in oxygen by the two systems, the digestive and the respiratory. The circulatory system, cardiovascular system really works to uh, transport these materials. And then waste will exit uh, by the digestive system, right? Elimination of food residues and the urinary system, elimination of excess water, salts, and waste. So products of uh, primarily protein metabolism will be released in the urinary system. So what, what organs do this process? And that would be the kidneys, right? So we have a pair of kidneys, two bean-shaped organs, right? Um, they have, their structure is uh, quite elaborate and we're taking in blood. So the kidneys are very vascular. We're taking in blood and then we're actually then as a result of this filtration of the blood via the kidneys, we're producing a filtrate, which will eventually become uh, the urine that we know. I need to stop my, I need to mute for a moment and turn something off. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so you'll see that the kidneys have a cortical region and they have an inner medullary region. Just like the, uh, the adrenal glands have an outer cortex and an inner medullary region. Well, the kidneys have the same kind of component but different structurally, okay? So we'll see here that there's also a capsule and this capsule will encompass and cover the whole, the entire kidney. Okay, so both kidneys are covered in this renal capsule. Okay, and then there's this central cavity that's going to contain, it's called the pelvis, and it's going to receive the, the urine that will be then drained via the ureters. Okay, we'll see that anatomy in a few minutes. Okay, now the kidneys can produce this EPO, this erythropoietin. Right, which will help to, in, when necessary, uh, stimulate the red bone marrow to produce more blood cells. Okay. It'll be involved in conversion of vitamin D to a form that uh, can aid in calcium absorption and so calcium metabolism, and also produce another um, hormone called renin, which will help to regulate blood pressure. Okay, in particular, if if need be, um, 
its its role really its function would be to increase blood pressure so if needed if the blood pressure needs to be increased renin can be released in order to stimulate that increase also primary functions removal of metabolic waste and adjust the fluid balance like i said from the very beginning that fluid metabolism fluid um, homeostasis the kidneys are have a very important role in that so the nephron this term here the nephron right that's the uh, functional and structural unit that's used to, uh, that is involved with receiving blood, filtering the blood, and then forming the urine that will relieve, that will be excreted from the body. Right? And there's going to be a lot of absorption, reabsorption that takes place in order to uh, reabsorb the fluids, reabsorb any nutrients, any other solutes that are necessary, and solutes that are that are waste need to be then excreted in the urine. So here you're seeing, and we're going to go over the anatomy here. We have here, so you know, you can see the heart here. You can see the diaphragm, okay, and that's when it's relaxed. It's in that shape, that dome shape. When it contracts, it actually straightens, it flattens the diaphragm. We have here the inferior vena cava, the the abdominal aorta. Okay? So oxygenated blood, deoxygenated blood. So oxygenated blood is going away from the heart. The Deoxygenated blood is going towards the heart. Okay? We have here sitting on top of each of these kidneys would be the adrenal glands. There's a capsule, right? That we're going to see the other components in, a, in just a moment. <coughs> and you'll see here also that there are these tubes. These tubes are the ureters, the ureters, which will drain the urine into the urinary bladder, and then it'll be uh, excreted via the urethra. Okay. So this is a female, so we have a shorter urethra here. Now, as far as the components are conserved, concerned regarding um, the position, the position would be very adjacent to your spine. So in my years of experience as a chiropractor and treatment and such, there were patients who had uh, kidney infections, right? And, and stones, right? Infections, stones that were present within the uh, kidneys that caused them to have back pain and I had to be able to differentially diagnose was it an actual pain issue with the spine and the nervous system or was it a kidney related and so you know that was something that was a part of what I did on a daily basis and you'll see here that the kidneys are adjacent to the spine and they are what's called retroperitoneal they are outside of the abdominal pelvic cavity okay Here's the peritoneum. This is the covering of the contents of the abdominal pelvic region. Kidneys are outside of that. Okay. Now you'll see here, as far as here's the capsule of the kidney right here. And then here would be the cortex in this region. So you're not really seeing, but right here. And then the medullary region is right here where these pyramids are located. The pyramids contain, and also the cortex contain the, the nephrons. That, that unit that actually will filter the blood to form urine. And what you're seeing here also is that there is a lot of blood that's going to, see the red, as far as the renal artery and the segmental arteries, the interlobar arteries, the arcuate arteries, and the cortical radiate arteries. These are all specific arteries that are taking fresh oxygenated blood to the kidneys. There's filtration will take place. And then the uh, venous system in blue will remove the uh, the deoxygenated blood that's been filtered and send it to uh, back to the heart okay but these these pyramids right here they they look like an upside down pyramid and at the apex here there are renal papillae there are little holes that will drain the urine into this pelvic region okay so we have these uh, areas that are uh, within here that will receive the urine into this pelvic region and then in the pelvis it will drain into the ureter to the urinary bladder for excretion via the urethra. So the important structure of the nephron that actually is uh, blood vessels it's like a little I, I say it's a knot of, it says here knot it's just like this bunch of little capillaries right that are in a bowl a bowl of capillaries it's called the glomerulus it's inside of a capsule it's inside of a covering okay 
And what will happen is that in this knot of capillaries, they're covered in little foot processes and such that will allow for the fluid and the uh, solutes to leave the blood, but the blood cells, right? So red blood cells, white blood cells should not be leaving that those capillary bed when filtration is taking place. Only the liquid portion gets filtered, okay? Then we have a proximal convoluted tubule, a distal tubule, and there's a nephron loop in between them. And then what's gonna happen is that this filtrate that's in the tubule, tubular system will then enter into this collecting duct and then this will be the urine that will leave out of the out of the real little tip here, the apex of the pyramid. So this area right here, the pelvis, will actually be what's receiving the urine and sending it to the ureter, to the urinary bladder. Okay. So within the, the production of urine, right, we have filtration. We have reabsorption of the majority of the water from the filtrate, the majority of the solutes and any nutrients that are there from the filtrate. And then only the urine will be, secretion is putting back into the urine, into the filtrate. And then that's what's gonna be leaving the body, like I said, with approximately one and a half to two liters of urine. This filtration, right, removes a large amount of fluid and solutes, to produce this fil filtrate. Reabsorption is when we actually take, return those useful substances back to the blood. Okay? So there are many blood vessels that are there, capillaries that are there to reabsorb uh, the fluid as well as solutes. Okay? And then you'll see here, so uh, glucose, amino acids, these are the building blocks for proteins. Um, sugar, you think of a simple sugar, monosaccharide, electrolytes. You're thinking of sodium ions and potassium ions and chloride ions and calcium ions, right? Most reabsorption takes a place takes place in the beginning of this tubular network. Okay, secretion is actually putting back into the tubular network, which contains the filtrate, which will become urine. What needs to leave the body? So the secretion will ensure that waste and any foreign substances don't build up in the blood, and this is very important. So when, when you hear of someone who's on dialysis, so we have um, a relative right now, a, a family member who is on dialysis and they're on a home type of dialysis where they connect themselves to a system that will actually help to put fluids in their peritoneum, their abdominal pelvic cavity, and it sits there overnight and it helps to absorb all of the bad uh, substances that need to be uh, excreted leaving the body uh, any type of anything that's uh that would not be healthy to, to hold on to filtering the blood and then helping to have it then leave the uh, abdominal pelvic region that's a form of the filtration of, of blood uh, that you can also be actually connected to um, a, a machine that will actually do in about a three to four hour process and usually the patients are on that like three times a week and that'll also be involved in removing any type of uh, substances that need to be removed from the blood, any type of uh, waste products, right? Um, now know that your human, the human body, the kidneys, when they're functioning, they're working 24 seven, sometimes more, sometimes less, but they're continually producing a filtrate, which will eventually become urine. Person who's on dialysis, their kidneys are not working at all. So they're only doing this every night, doing that type of uh, process of dialysis or three times a week. So imagine that they're not still feeling it so great in comparison to, um, to our kidneys as far as they're doing their job 24 seven. Now you're gonna see here, this is a representation of the nephron, okay? So here we have that capsule, capsule, that's covering this knot of capillaries, this bowl of capillaries. Now it's, it's, it's a unique capillary bed, I have to tell you that, in that there is, um, there is a arteriole, it's a small artery, and there's an arteriole here, a small artery, leading to this capillary bed. Usually what happens is we have an arteriole leading to blood to the capillary bed and then a venule leaving. This is a little bit unique and different. Now, Surrounding this whole system, see this tube? This is tubular network that I was talking about. 
surrounding this tubular system are going to be other small blood vessels, right, capillaries and such, that will actually reabsorb the uh, nutrients. Re so you'll look at here. So sodium ions, chloride ions, potassium ions, nutrients, tubular reabsorption takes place close to the glomerular capsule, okay, the glomerulus. Secretion is where we're actually putting back into the filtrate. See the yellow? That's the filtrate. This filtrate in the tubular network will become urine in the collecting duct. Okay? And you're just seeing as far as, so this is the proximal, this is the distal, this is the loop. Okay? And so different things are being, different processes are taking place depending upon where you are in this tubular network. Okay? And you'll see here as far as whether substances are leaving right, or going back into. So the blue is take, putting back into the filtrate. The green is removing from the filtrate. And you'll see here that most of the water is being re reabsorbed because again, I said to you that approximately uh, eight to 10 of those two liter bottles of fluid are being produced as far as filtrate. But what's actually leaving the body is only about one and a half to two liters of fluid, right, in urine. The rest of it's being reabsorbed back into the body, into the, into the cardiovascular system, into the blood. And that's what's doing it, folks. It's the blood that's receiving the fluid back from this filtrate that's being produced. So it's a little bit of a complex, it absolutely is a complex situation here. I, I just wanna ask and just see, I know it, this is not an easy concept, I understand that, but no, again, it's just, the basic is just filtering blood in the kidneys, we're reabsorbing most of the nutrients, most of the water, most of the ions and electrolytes, and we're only excreting a little bit of urine in comparison to what's being actually produced. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to ask? Or are we okay? It's something that you really have to like read the chapter, review, go over it, listen to my lecture, you know, time or so, and uh, I'll post this on YouTube uh, later on today. All right. I'll share my screen and continue on. So let's go here. So that this is a really good. So this is a really good uh, table right here. Just also just so I like this, this image right here is very helpful just to see. I'm not going to ask that you memorize all of what takes place, but you should know that this is the proximal tubule, the distal in between is this loop. Here's the collecting duct. Here's the glomerulus, this capillary bed. That This is where filtration takes place. And then we have reabsorption and secretion. You should know these terms. These are terms that you should know. And that the urine is left present within the collecting duct and will be sent into the renal pelvis and out through the ureter to the urinary bladder out via the urethra. Okay. And here you're just seeing as far as, so see that here? So the percent that's actually produced as urine is only like 1% of the whole total of filter filtrate that's being produced. So I said to you that, you know, 180 liters, you know, that's, that's a lot of fluid, folks. That's a lot of filtrate, but only, you know, one, one liter to two liters, one and a half to two liters, that's what's really being produced. So the process of urination, okay? It's a reflex that we can all control because we can control when we void, when we urinate, right? This is something that, it's a, it's a neurological situation that we, um, we it's, a, it's something that we learn as we're younger, right? And uh, I have to tell you that as far as uh, in doing this quote unquote potty training with four children over the years was, that was a tough thing, let me tell you. It's not an easy thing to uh, potty train children help them to learn how to use the toilet correctly and when to hold it and when to, to release. Yeah, it's, it's challenging. You'll see here, here's the representation of so these tubes right here. Those are the ureters. Here's the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder, like the stomach, has rugae. It, it, can, it can expand, right, because it fills up with fluid. And here are the openings where the ureters bring the fluid, the urine, into there into the bladder. And then we have here, we have an internal and an external sphincters, right? Internal, external sphincters that will help to control uh, the, 
when how much fluid is leaving. You know, Dan, I'm, I I apologize that I don't know exactly how much it can hold. I, it's something I never really memorized. I apologize. I can look it up. Absolutely, I'll look it up and I'll let you know. Um, but I won't do that right at the moment here. But um, I would imagine. I would imagine up to maybe, up, up, oh golly, I would say like a liter at the most. I don't know, maybe a little bit less than, I'm, that's what I'm guessing because the bladder, maybe, maybe less than that, maybe half of that. Yeah, because I'm thinking of the anatomy of it, maybe about a half of a liter or so. Yeah, maybe about a half a liter. I'll, I'll look that up though and I'll let you know. I'm sorry, I don't know, I did not memorize that number. So uh, how kidneys uh, help manage fluid balance and blood pressure. So I, I need to just say one statement to you that if we have an increase in blood pressure, it's as a result of an increase in blood volume. Okay? So if we have an increase in blood volume, we have an increase in blood pressure. Okay. So see here where it says total volume of blood fluid stays approximately the same. I showed you that right in the very beginning there, how how much we take in and how much we, how much leaves, that that really balances out, okay? Um, but if we're having issues, if we're having some type of issue with our kidneys, uh, issues with our cardiovascular system, then we can have issues with uh, our blood pressure going up and down or or staying too high or even staying too low, well, depending upon the condition. All right, and you'll see here that this is an area, so, Here's the cortical region. Here's the medullary region. So this is the area, the medulla, medulla is the region of the uh, pyramids, okay? So the cortic, cortex is the outer part. Here's the capsule, cortex, medulla. This is the pyramid. And you'll see here that we have these nephrons, these nephrons. So here's the, um, the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule, proximal tubule, the nephron loop, the distal tubule, the collecting duct. And the collecting duct will, will, through this opening, this renal papilla, will release the urine into the pelvic region of the kidneys. And so you'll see here that a lot of water reabsorption takes place on the left side of the nephron loop. And then we have, as far as electrolytes are concerned, being reabsorbed on the right side. No water moves on that right side. So you'll see here, as far as uh, hormones are concerned, so aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, ADH, are involved in helping to maintain this water balance, okay? And also in turn, affecting blood pressure. So really, if it says antidiuretic, so a diuretic is a type of medicine that will help you to produce more urine. You'll, you'll, you'll have more frequent visits to the, to the restroom having to void as a result of a diuretic. So patients who have high blood pressure, can be put on a diuretic in order to produce more urine and decrease the blood volume, which should in turn decrease blood pressure. Okay, so antidiuretic uric hormone works opposite of that, and it's what we would say is a water conserving type of a hormone. So we don't produce as much urine if we have antidiuretic hormone being uh, produced and released in uh, higher higher levels. Okay, so it's conserving all the water that we have present. And as a result, it can result in an increase in blood volume, which in turn leads to an increase in blood pressure. Now, aldosterone also can increase blood pressure by increasing the reabsorption of sodium. So if we hold on, if we increase more sodium absorption, right, then water will follow this sodium reabsorption and will increase blood volume and increase blood pressure. So those are two hormones that are very important as far as the maintenance of uh, fluid levels and uh, blood blood fluid, blood the blood volume, which would in turn affect blood pressure. And you'll see here where the two different hormones will affect as far as aldosterone and as far as ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And here it just gives you a little bit as far as what's taking place with uh, the really very important areas of uh, the, the nervous system, which will in turn send messages to the kidneys, the urinary system, which will then be involved in whether we're kicking out more uh, hormones or not, 
which can in turn affect blood volume, which can in turn affect blood pressure. So that hypothalamus, this is the area. So you'll see here, as far as here's the pituitary gland right here. And right in this region, the inner portion of the brain is where you have the thirst center. Okay. So it tells the body to, to find and drink fluids. That's that's pretty much what it does. So that's the thirst center, and that's that hypothalamus there. Now, this is interesting, and this is just showing you, and I'm not going to even I won't test you on this. This is um, at a higher level that I don't expect you to know. But I just want you to see that there are multiple hormones, chemicals involved in the regulation of the fluids present within your body, which would in turn affect the blood volume and the blood pressure. This is a kind of a nicer looking picture of the glomerulus, this, this uh, bowl of capillaries, this knot of capillaries, with these, I mentioned before, these foot processes that will allow for fluid to leave the blood, but not the blood cells to leave. So if you have blood within your urine, they'll call it hematuria. If you have glucose in your urine, they'll, call, they'll say you have glucose urea. Those are, it's not good to have high levels of glucose. It's not good to have any blood cells in your urine. Okay, that means that there could be issues with the filtration mechanism here within the glomerular capsule. Okay, so the filtrates present here in this capsule, and it leads to this tubular network, the proximal tube. Here's the distal tube, and many reactions are taking place here that I'm not going to really go into detail for you all because I don't expect that you will have to memorize this. Now know that the uh, blood pH. If it's 7.3 to 7.5, it's a little a little um, on the, the alkaline side. It's not acidic. Acidic would be below 7.0, right? So 6.9 pH and below would be an acidic urine. That's not good. The normal blood pH, alkaline, 7.3 to 7.5. Kidneys can either excrete bicarbonate or form new bicarbonate, and this bicarbonate is a buffer that can help with pH regulation. Um, uh, acidic environment within the body overall is not a good thing. Um, the only acidic environment that's positive would be, say, within the stomach. It's very acidic. That's a good thing. But other than that, folks, really more of an, like, closer to, really, your physiological pH of the body, of the whole body and blood and such, 7.3. And you'll see here as far as, so if the blood is too acidic, um, bicarbonate will be produced and released. Um, if it's too basic, if the pH is too high, then we'll be releasing the bicarbonate via the urinary system. Now, know this here. So acidosis and alkalosis. So acidic, blood is too acidic, right? Can cause severe diarrhea, kidney disease, and other problems. Uh, alkalosis where the pH is too high, it's higher than 7.5, then what happens is that it's alkaline, it's basic, um, vomiting, dehydration, hormonal disorders, both of these not healthy issues at all. Kidney stones, these are just uh, can be very terrible for patients to experience. They're uh, very uncomfortable, uh, they cause quite a bit of pain and uh, really are um, are really not something that you would wish on yourself. Um, primarily, they're, they're full of uh, calcium, okay? But not all. They can be other types of uh, combinations of different types of uh, salts and such, and uh, calcium and other types of uh, minerals and such can create these stones, but primarily it's calcium. Uh, they can lead to blockage of urine. And again, this can lead to pain and discomfort. And where it says here, large stones must be medically removed, right? Surgically or medical, you know, they, whether they put what's called a stent in the uh, ureters to allow for them to be a little bit wider so that the uh, stone can pass through, but again, painful. This glomerular, glomerulonephritis. So what is this going to affect? It's going to affect the filtration aspect of the kidneys, okay? That glomerulus. Okay, so chronic high blood pressure and diabetes as a result of uh, the capillaries are being damaged, right, of the glomerulus, 
reduces blood flow through the glomeruli. Um, toxic byproducts accumulate in the blood, so you're you're not fully producing the correct uh, urine filtrate in urine that is leaving the body. You're reabsorbing and holding on to too much of the waste products. And dialysis can help to keep a person alive, um, but this is it's a tough thing to have to deal with, to be honest. Polycystic kidney disease. This is where there are actual cysts that develop in the kidneys, and the kidneys actually, so that the, the healthy tissue gets replaced with these cysts, and the kidneys, oh my gosh, they can get very, very large in size. Um, do I have an image? Yeah, I do. Yeah, we'll look at that in a moment. So this is this is really a sad condition. It doesn't go away. It's a chronic condition that will get worse to the point where it'll destroy the kidney. Okay. So early symptom can be frequent urinary tract infections. Um, they'll need to in severe cases uh, need a kidney transplant and need dialysis because the healthy tissue that's filtering the blood to perform to, to form the filtrate the urine it gets replaced with these cysts. So these cysts can actually increase the size of the uh, increase the size of the kidney by two or more two two or more times. Now recall I said to you that. Uh, I, I explained to you this peritoneal dialysis and these hemodialysis. Hemodialysis, it's a machine that's going to actually filter the blood. In peritoneal dialysis, this solution is put into the abdominal pelvic region. The waste diffuses across the lining of the cavity into the solution, and then it's actually drained out. So we call it an exchange. Okay? An exchange takes place. You put the fluid in in the beginning of the night. At the end of the night, the fluid is drained out and removed, and then hopefully the wastes are also being removed. Whereas with hemodialysis, it's actually a machine that's actually taking the blood, so it takes about three to four hours, and you're filtering it through this machine, and then it's being returned to the body. There are um, the other types of issues that can go on as far as, uh, <laughs> as far as, uh, Tumors are concerned, so cancer is concerned. Um, this type of Wilms tumor is a type of kidney cancer. Um, also urinary tract infections. Um, women are more susceptible only because of the close proximity of the urethra uh, to the anus. And so if there's an issue with uh, the bacteria from the uh, digestive tract entering into the urinary tract, that can cause an infection. Nephritis is, a, is, a, is a, an infection that's taking place in the kidneys. Primarily, it's bacterial, but it can also um, be other, you know, viral type infection. But primarily, it's bacterial that uh, that is the cause, the etiology. Okay. Painkillers. So painkillers like acetaminophen, so ibuprofen. These are so anti-inflammatory, and they're both pain medications. Analgesics. Uh, this would be like a Tylenol. This would be ibuprofen. Would be like a, Advil, right? Um, these can all chronic use of them, right? People that are taking these medications every day, they're taking them in high doses over time, do 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 damage to the urinary system and uh, to the kidneys in particular. And we mentioned this as far as the uh, fluid balance that's taking place within the body as a result of the kidneys performing their job and their task. Now, look at this here, folks, and I, I don't try to scare you with this, but just I want you to see that 95,000 people in the United States today, and this is, this is, this is about, a, this is a couple year old uh, PowerPoint, right? So we're looking at the, the figures gotta be higher, but that's a lot of people that are waiting for kidneys, just in the United States, right? Um, we have, like I said, I told you about a relative who's going on dialysis right now, and um, this relative is, uh, is waiting for a kidney donation. Yeah, they're on the list. And they received a kidney from a family member um, going back about a little bit less than 15 years ago, which is quite remarkable because kidneys do not, donated kidneys do not normally last that long, but it was from a family member, so they can last longer than expected. <laughs> 